This video is gonna be the most in-depth muscular anatomy video for the core that you can find anywhere on the internet. This is part two of a three-part series of muscular anatomy for personal trainers. Let's jump in. Coach Joe Drake with the Axiom Fitness Academy. If this is the first video you're joining me for, this one is a special one because I know from running these courses for so long that memorizing and learning muscular anatomy is always a challenge. And I also know if you're watching this video, you're probably a visual learner. So I hope that what we're gonna go through here is gonna help you guys just solidify this to your brain because my goal is for you to be able to look at the core muscles, especially as we go through the local and the global core muscles. I want you to be able to visualize where they are when you're working with a client. That is the end goal. Because aside from passing your exam, that's what's gonna make you a great trainer. And the first thing we're gonna do is we're gonna take a look at what we call the local core musculature. If you're thinking about this as like an onion, this is the inner layer of the onion. These are gonna be muscles that are closer to the spine, right? If you're trying to remember where do they belong, you can think about proximity. You can also think about the size of some of these muscles. They're gonna be a little bit smaller and they're gonna be more what we call type one, more endurance-based postural muscles. So what we need to do to start is first off, we're gonna take a look here. We're gonna kind of strip some muscles away and get closer to the spine. So you guys can see, I'm gonna pull away some muscles and we're gonna get all the way down to our first core muscle, which I'm gonna be honest, most of you guys probably would not think of this as a core muscle, but as we look at where it attaches and what it does, it's an important one. And the first one is gonna be the diaphragm, right? I like to say diaphragm, helps me remember how to spell it. But you can see it's this umbrella-shaped muscle that sits right up into the rib cage. And you might be thinking, Joe, this is a breathing muscle. And you're right, this is where breathing and core start to become really intertwined. And this is gonna be one, when this muscle contracts and it flattens out, it is gonna draw air into the body. And hopefully, if we breathe appropriately, this is how we're gonna do more of our normal breathing at a lower energy state. But what we can also see here, as we start to look at this, I got it highlighted on the screen, and you can see the little yellow strand here is that part of our diaphragm actually attaches directly to our lumbar spine. So if this muscle has direct attachment to the lumbar spine, then we know it's gonna be involved in some capacity when it comes to core. And what we can start to think about with this local core muscle musculature is we're almost creating this box of stability. And if you think about the diaphragm, the diaphragm is gonna be the top of that box. And as we build all these muscles in, I'm gonna show you the engagement of all of them together helps to create what we call segmental stability of the spine. This is like spinous process to spinous process. How do we control the relationship? Diaphragm, gonna be one of your first important core muscles. Now, if we have the top of the box, we're gonna look at what's the bottom of the box. And I'm gonna be honest, guys, I'm gonna put you in a little compromised position here as we start looking at some of these muscles because we're gonna go right into the pelvic floor musculature, which yes, you're like, wait a minute, is he about to pull me around? Yep, we're going to the undercarriage here, all right? And you can take a look. We think about the pelvic floor, and this is a common topic of conversation with female clients, sometimes especially like postnatal, they've had a child. Obviously the relationship of the hips has changed, but it's not uncommon for men to also have some pelvic floor dysfunction. And thankfully, we don't need to memorize all the different muscles down here, but you can see essentially at the bottom of the pelvis, we've got this little system of musculature that should help create kind of the, the bottom of the box and a little bit of stability. Again, a very common one that has some issues, kind of an odd one to think about training, but when it comes to the local core, this is gonna be the bottom of that box of stability. All right, so we've got the diaphragm, we've got the pelvic floor. Now we need to start thinking about, you know, how do we wrap it all together if we're gonna create this little canister? Well, what I'm gonna do first is I'm actually gonna flip you guys around, and this is maybe a muscle you've heard of before, the TVA, your transverse abdominis. And as we can see here, this is a muscle that actually kind of wraps horizontally. It's one of the few real horizontal muscles. But if we had the diaphragm that makes the top of the box, we have our pelvic floor that makes the bottom, this is what kind of starts to seal it all in. You can almost think of your transverse abdominis as like shrink wrapping your midsection and your organs. And maybe you've been in, a class before and you've heard the cue, draw your belly button into your spine. And if you're watching this right now, you might be able to do that. Like I'm doing it, I'm pulling my belly button into my spine, but I can still breathe and talk. It's a lower level of core engagement. That's gonna be more transverse abdominis. And it just helps in this inner unit to create a little bit more stability in this area. And now we get to flip back around to a couple of smaller muscles. All right, you can start to think of these as the muscles that are just gonna create some connection even from vertebra to vertebra. So we talked about the box, 
diaphragm, pelvic floor, transverse abdominis. Now we gotta get into a couple of muscles that as you guys can see here on the screen, these ones are connecting like vertebra to vertebra. And I'm gonna be honest, you're probably gonna you know, uh, think it sounds a little funny. For me, I don't know why, I call them the rotatores. It helps me remember it. It's like kind of like Italian. Maybe they're rotators, but rotatores just sounds better. Um, if you know how to say it, leave a comment down here because I have no idea. But anyways, you can see these are really, really tiny muscles that connect like literally like vertebra to vertebra. So inherently, as I look at it, like they're not big prime movers. They're not huge muscles that are totally flexing the spine. If I look at it though, isolated, they could give me a little lateral flexion in the spine, maybe if they all work together extension, but they're more about just controlling the relationship from one vertebra to the next. And what you'll also find as we connect muscular anatomy to other things you've been learning, these are gonna be very rich in muscle spindles and Golgi tendon organs, which means the local core musculature, it's not only about stabilizing the spine, but it's giving our nervous system a ton of information about where our body is and these are going to have a lot of them so we have the rotatoris and then on top of that slightly bigger muscles this kind of starts to help us transition into even our global musculature is going to be our multifidus now you can see all right this looks like a slightly thicker bundle of muscle fibers going all the way right here from the pelvis up into our cervical spine. And as you look at these muscles, this is a really good example. Now, if you look at the isolated function, these can laterally flex the spine. They can also both work to extend. But really, if you think about posture, carrying our body around all day, right? I said posture and everyone's like, pulls the shoulders back. These muscles help to hold that position. They're a little bit more endurance based, so they're not gonna be big prime movers, but they're gonna be the ones that help to keep me upright throughout the day and help to create just a better connection between my pelvis and all these vertebra as we move further up. And the final one, right, the final of our local core system before we translate over into our big prime mover core muscles is gonna be the QL, your quadratus lumborum. This might be one. If any of you guys have ever been to a physical therapist, maybe for some hip and back issues, this is a common source of error for a lot of people or source of issue. And what you can see though, as we look at this muscle, and I'm actually gonna isolate it for you guys so you can see it without everything else there, is it connects, right? It really starts and you see this connection point here on the pelvis and it makes the connection from our pelvis right up into our lumbar vertebra, all right? So if you look at that and you look at the image on here, these muscles, if I think about what they do, they could hike the hip up right? Like if, if I contracted them that way, but really what they're doing most of the time throughout the day is they're helping to control the relationship between our pelvis and our vertebra, right? Which is a really important one because the vertebra is kind of like the keystone and the spine sits on top of it. And so the relationship between our pelvis and our vertebra is very important for maintaining posture, position, whatever types of movements we're doing. And this muscle is an important one. This one is actually part of what we call the lateral subsystem, which means it helps to control frontal plane motion of the body. When I'm walking, when I'm running, I generally don't want a lot of frontal plane activity. If so, it's usually wasted energy. And so this muscle oftentimes is isometrically contracting to help control that position. All right, so our local core muscles, these are really important for posture and position. And just to get you guys in the brain of remembering it, we've got our diaphragm, pelvic floor, transverse abdominis. We also then have our rotatoris and our motifidus. And then the last one we just went through was the quadratus lumborum. And now that we covered our local core musculature, we get to move into the next system. And we call these systems because if the local core muscles were more about segmental stability of the hips and spine, our global core muscles are now more about force transfer, right? When I say force transfer, I mean bigger motions and movements, everything from running to jumping to throwing, pushing and pulling. These muscles now, they're not only gonna help work to stabilize the spine, but they're gonna work to drive more motion in the hips and in the spine. So they're gonna be some bigger muscles. Again, maybe some muscles you might not think about in regards to the core, but we're gonna start with one that's probably most familiar when you think about core musculature. And you can see here the traditional iconic six-pack muscles. If I had a better six-pack, I'd show you, but we're just gonna use the image on the screen instead, all right? So when it comes to these muscles, we wanna make sure we think about orientation, fiber alignment, which just means like if I look at this image and I think about what direction it looks like these fibers are running, the rectus abdominis is about as vertical as it gets, right? These muscles are running straight up and down, which means if they shorten, right, they shorten 
this is gonna be flexion of the spine. Crunches, V-ups, you know, the exercises you might think of when you think about training the core. They're also gonna work to resist extension, and this is where we start to get into the different types of core contraction. We talked about drawing in, which is very much like Pilates driven, right? I don't wanna make the assumption, but it's a little bit lower level. And now we can talk about some of these global muscles, right? The difference between drawing in and bracing. Bracing is like, if someone's gonna punch you in the stomach, if I'm doing a heavy squat or a deadlift, those are the types of core engagement I'm gonna be looking for. Much, much more tension, and it's gonna use these muscles as well. So no matter what, rectus abdominis, really big, powerful muscle, throwing, explosive, definitely gonna be more involved. And probably the one you think about when you think about the core. Next up, you can see here on the screen as well, is gonna be our first layer of the obliques, the external obliques, right? And I say first layer because we have multiples as we get kind of inside the body. But from the surface level standpoint, the obliques actually cover a lot of surface area. You can see the angle of fiber run is almost more like if I was putting my hands in my front pockets. But the thing is, is those obliques wrap all the way around from under the rib cage. And even if we look a little further back around the body, they really, really come all the way and wrap around. So oftentimes when we're thinking about oblique exercises, these muscles are gonna be involved, right? When we lateral flexion, they're gonna help to drive frontal plane motion. But if you look at the angle, kind of that fiber run down, these muscles are very much gonna be involved in rotation. Everything from rotation, if I'm throwing something, swinging something, um, to like exercises, high to low chops, these ones are gonna be definitely involved just based on that angle and that fiber run. And you can see, they really come all the way down into that connective tissue that's kind of involved with that lower abdominal area. So you can see it kind of connects up to some of that white tissue there, which is gonna be great. Important connective tissue, as when those muscles pull on that tissue, it just helps to create that tension. So we have the, you know, we've got our rectus abdominis, we've got the external obliques, and now as we pull a layer away, you're gonna see the difference in size between the external and the internal. I'll go back for a second. External, much larger surface area spanning here outside the rib cage. And now when we go to the internal, eh, it kind of sits a little bit lower. And you can see it's actually the opposite fiber angle. If our external obliques come forward, internal come backwards, which is cool because the intertwined mixture of those layers means that like no matter what direction we're moving in, we're not gonna not be able to control it and generate force. I mean, we've got you know high to low. You guys don't need to get caught up. If you look at what we call the function, isolated function of some of these muscles, you'll see one of the obliques is more involved in contralateral rotation, which means to the opposite side. One's more involved in ipsilateral, which means same side. That might be a higher level thinking that we need to get into to, but we know they're involved in not just frontal plane, side to side motion, but also rotation in pretty much every direction that the body can go in. So those are our two layers of the obliques. And you can see, same idea, these obliques are gonna wrap back around. They've got some attachment here to the pelvis and they start to connect up to some of our tissue in the backside. All right, so those are some of our big ones. Now we're gonna go to two that a lot of people might not think of as core muscles, right? We had rectus abdominis, we had the obliques, cool, those are ones I'm familiar with. What about the hip flexors? All right, so as I dive in a little deeper, this is an area of the body that oftentimes may not be thought of as core, but as you look at where these muscles are, it makes sense. These muscles help to create connection from our lumbar spine to our femur and our pelvis to our femur. So when we talk about force transfer, a lot of forces, when I'm squatting, lunging, they all come here through the body, and this is the connection point between these two areas. Now, we talk about the hip flexors. Sometimes this is called the iliopsoas complex, but it's really two muscles. The first one I have highlighted for you guys, this is the iliacus. This one creates connection from our pelvis to our femur, so it crosses right over. So when we think hip flexion, just creating that connection from our body and our torso to our thigh, gonna be an important one. And then we see a little longer one here. This is our psoas. And this one, you guys might be able to relate to. Maybe you've been lying on the ground before and doing like some traditional leg lifts where you have your leg coming all the way up and back down. And oftentimes, even if there's no pain, you'll kind of feel your low back getting like lifted off the ground. Well, this muscle is exactly why. You can see this muscle attaches from our femur to our lumbar spine. So these legs, when you're doing leg lift, guys, these are real long, heavy levers. And so as that leg goes down, that muscle gets stretched and it can pull up on the lumbar spine. So 
not terrible for everyone, but if you have clients who are kind of complaining of feeling like they're low back when they're doing those movements, that's exactly why. And you might want to alter the exercise. But this is the cool part about being able to visualize the muscular anatomy is because it allows us to better problem solve what's going on in the gym with clients. And we all know a lot of our clients are either going to want or they're going to need some important core training. And this is the muscles that we need to know. All right. So definitely our hip flexors, very important core musculature. And I'll be honest, they're usually pretty weak for a lot of people. Not a lot of people spend a lot of time training this motion or training this motion. And so over time, this can become a very weak area for a lot of people. So if we go from there, let's flip around to our last one, really of our global musculature. And this one is another unsung hero of the core, not a muscle oftentimes people think of as a core muscle. And this is going to be your lats or your latissimus dorsi, which as you guys see this posterior view, first off, this is one of my favorite anatomical views because there's just so many layers of muscles here on the back side of the body. The lats, they cover a ton of surface area, right? So really, if you look at that, they come down into this white tissue, this thoracolumbar fascia. And as you can see here too, these is like almost like tightens right into the low back area. And so when we create tension in the lats, right, even as you're watching this video, if you can engage the lats or you think about going into a deadlift and you kind of pull that bar into your body, that helps to create tension in the lats. When the lats tense up, they pull on that thoracolumbar fascia. That's a good thing. It almost creates a natural weight belt for the body to help stabilize the spine. And this is a really, really common one for people who maybe have back pain when they deadlift or they struggle with maintaining position. Sometimes they just don't know how to engage their lats as a core muscle instead of a prime mover. But you can see here, really important core muscle and really important for force transfer. All right, although we don't talk, NASM no longer really includes the glutes per se in their global core muscle system. They used to have three systems. But you can kind of see this strong connection here as we're talking about the lats between the lats and the glutes. They almost look like one connected tissue through that thoracolumbar fascia. And they're also a part of what we call the posterior sling of the body. Anyways, really important to understand lats are a very underserved, under commonly thought about core muscle, but an important one to train. And the last one here inside your guys' global system is a little bit deeper, right? We've got the lats here. And I, again, I love this view because we start to see how many layers of muscles are on the backside. It's a lot more muscles on the backside of the body than the front when it comes to our upper body. But the lats, and as we start to layer away, we take away the lats, we take away our traps, and now we start to get into some slightly larger. Before we had the multifidus, which was like a little thicker band, but it was pretty small. Now, the good thing for you guys, especially if you're testing as a trainer, or honestly, just as a new trainer, you probably don't need to know all the individual muscles, right? The iliocostalis, you've got the, you know, uh, the thoracus. There's multiple muscles that make this up. Commonly, we talk about is the erector spinae, erector spinae. And these are really, really important, strong posterior chain muscles. Posterior chain, think about an exercise like an RDL. You know, commonly we think about training the glutes and the hamstrings, and those may be prime movers, but these erector spinae muscles also now become really important. They're either working to stabilize the spine, or they're also synergistically working to help extend the hips and bring us up into position. Definitely an important one for us to want to strengthen, really great for back health, or especially if you're an athlete and you're trying to be strong and powerful, these muscles play a big role. I hope this video was helpful and you guys better visualizing what's going on inside the body. Not only because I want you guys to go on, succeed, and pass your exams as a trainer, but I know if you can do this, if you can visualize what's going on, you're gonna have so much more confidence when you're working with clients, and that's what it's all about. The last thing I'll say is if you guys haven't gotten your hands on our anatomy guide, we've got a really cool study resource for you guys who are trying to memorize muscular anatomy. Make sure you guys check out the link in the description below. I'll see you guys soon.